Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hi, this is Michael Waits from Asia Tech Podcast Stories. I'm here with Angela McKay. Angela is the managing director and the publisher of Asia Pacific for the Financial Times and also a board member. You must be extremely busy. We talked about that before. I'm relatively busy, but you know, hey, I'm a very good organizer of my time. So there's always plenty of time to do a little bit of internet shopping while I'm on all those long conference calls. <laughs> I liked what you said to me the last time we spoke. You said, I'm very good at signing things. <laughs> that's, that's partly what it is. You've got to be, your, your wrist and hand should be insured for a vast amount of cash because that's really my primary importance, I think. <laughs> Anybody can do my job, but not everybody can do my signature. Yeah, and I actually, I'm, um, I really like somebody. I have a lot of respect for somebody who's willing to say my job is really just signing things. It leads me to believe that actually what they're really doing is getting a whole bunch of stuff done. I'm actually pretty wary of people who tell me I get stuff done all day. I really believe that those people are probably just signing things all day, to be be fair. Beautifully. Signing things beautifully. Very beautifully. Well-trained signing. Um, How are you? I'm very, very well. Um, it's coming into the start of Q4, and like uh, we have a calendar year at the FT, so like everybody else, we're really focusing on how we can maximize revenues and profit in the last quarter of the year just to make sure that we can reinforce all our bonuses come next year. Yeah, it's an interesting time, right? So we're almost we're in the middle of September, almost at the beginning of October, right? And this kind of reminds me of back when I was in the financial world. It was kind of the same thing, right? We have budgets. Mm-hmm. We're kind of getting close to the end of the third quarter and, you know, whether we're close or not so close to the budgets, the fourth quarter is really push time, right? Where it's really mm-hmm. time to say, is the business doing what we expected it to do this year? Mm. If it is, let's accelerate that. And if it's not, what do we even need to do just in the last quarter to change it and make it better, right? Yeah. And uh, that's, that's I suppose, the beauty of quarterly forecasting because you can revisit the numbers um, three times a year to tweak and adjust uh, and hopefully raise, but uh, often it's kind of a panic stations. But um, all the best blade plans can, of course, fall apart. But for the FT, it's um, it's been a pretty good year uh, with climbing subscriptions because, as you probably know, we've got a goal to reach 1 million paid-for subscriptions uh, by uh, uh, by 2020. That's a really big number, actually. This is yeah, actually... it's, a, it's a huge number. It's it's more well right at the moment we've got about eight hundred and twenty six thousand, and that's the most paying subscribers the FT has ever had in its one hundred and twenty eight year history. So for us, you know, digital has been uh, fantastically challenging, but it's an enabler. It hasn't. Desic- you know, desiccated and decimated our business. It's actually given us the opportunity to reach a whole new audience right around the world and increase our subscription um, rates and levels. Right. So this is the part of the media business to me that's really exciting. And we kind of touched mm. on this earlier. I mean, a, a month or so ago. And that is, mm. in the old in the old days, right? Even a print business, but even a even a digital media business was always kind of a local or regional business, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right, and, and, and had local characteristics. Right, but that meant that, and the FTs actually had always done a good job, right? I think I told you this. I was reading it when I was in college, and that was almost 30 years ago, and that was, it wasn't yeah, digital. I love print, subscribers. Right? I love long-term subscribers <laughs> particularly, so thank you, Michael. You're very welcome. Your children will thank me as well, I'm sure. <laughs> um, You've already put them through school. <laughs> <laughs> I, still have my, I still have my children to go. Um <laughs> But the point is that it's always kind of been a global business with a with a global outlook, right? And that's been great. But from a subscription mm-hmm. level, the regionality of it or the locality of it always meant that it was slightly limited, not just your business, mm-hmm. but the media business in general. But you know, you sure. ha- you heard a lot a lot of storm and drang really at the beginning of the digital media revolution of mm-hmm. oh god, now what are we going to do? Everything needs to be free. No one's going to pay for this. And yet, I mm-hmm. believe what you believe, and that is that this subscription model, particularly for high-quality content, is always going to exist and actually accelerates because in an era where telling the difference between truth and fiction is really Mm. hard, subscribing to something where you believe has like a really strong reputation for just telling the truth in a way that's as unbiased as possible, I think sort of plays Mm -hmm. to your strengths, no? Yeah, it does. And um, in this era of so-called fake news, uh, I think that a lot of people do want to cut cut through all the crap, basically. Excuse my... No, I agree. Word, but <laughs> cut through the crap because, A, they've got no time. Everyone's time is, is um, being claimed by so many different um, 
websites, television, the office, webinars. Um, it, it just, it's just a, a, an incredible cacophony of noise it that, is. that comes at you every day. So if you can isolate a few sources where you think, okay, I'm going to go to that every day because I think it's a, a, a really good, um, yardstick by which to measure my crazy life by. And also it also helps me with my business. So for us, the FT has always been a business tool. And I think you expect to pay for a business tool that provides value for you uh, day by day. So I think for us, it's been a lot easier than, say, general interest newspapers to be able to make that transition to a digital uh, product and then also to be able to put up a, a war, a subscription model. And uh, and of course, in many jurisdictions, the FT is also tax deductible. So there's there's a, a <laughs> lot of things working, a lot of things working for us um, as well as. Uh, being a clarion, I think, for true, uh, reliable, and analyzable, that's not even a word, but I'm going to throw it in there, information. So it helps people day-to-day make decisions about their business. Do you feel like being in Asia, it gives you a little bit more leeway on the types of sort of creative, when I say creative, I just mean the types of digital distribution you can do, the types of creative risk you can take? Um for new mechanisms for distribution, right? Whether that's video, podcasting, mm. new types mm. of distribution. Do you feel like you have more leeway or is it something that just comes down from the top and the firm itself is actually open enough and, you know, views this as a big opportunity enough that you can do some of that experimentation? Yeah. In fact, the FT has been pretty relaxed about that as long as long as we, we well, we've got very, very strong um, and... Uh, potent protection of the brand right. in action everywhere. So the, the most important thing is the brand because, you know, that's that's the value and that's what people trust. Everything else comes underneath it. So as long as we're protecting our brand 100%, uh, then, then experimentation uh, is encouraged because uh, I know people, the, the, the whole fad about it's good to fail because you learn from your mistakes. It's never good to fail. Failing is horrible because you wasted time and, and all sorts of other things. But sometimes it does lead you to make new decisions that are going to work better for you. Most of our decision making around tech um, and distribution comes out of head office in London. However, we've got big hubs in New York and Hong Kong and they are, we're also empowered to uh, get on with some experimentation. So for us, uh, the whole podcast world, um, video, a lot richer, deeper, longer video now. It's quite common for the FT to do um, work that is around 15 to 20 minutes long. And that's without ads um, during it. So it's almost like a little mini TV program. It is. So, uh, and that kind of engagement is very important for us because for for, for the FT, it is all about engagement because the more engaged your audience is, the more likely they are to renew if they're an individual subscriber. And, of course, the more money you can charge if they are B2B, a, a corporate licensee, because um, we have to be incredibly transparent with our corporate customers. So if you're company X and you have 200 seats globally, uh, 200 logins globally for FT.com, um, then it's not going to automatically renew unless they have seen the um, efficacy, the use of that information and how many people are logging in, using the information, how many stories they read a day, a week, a month, how long they spend on the site. So we have to be able to provide all those metrics so that we'll be not only able to convince company X that they should renew, but we say, actually, you're spending a lot more time on there than you originally said you would. So we're going to act, we're going to have an uplift of about 15% in that annual corporate license fee. So doing the homework, getting the distribution right, getting your metrics straight just helps you make a lot of money. And of course, data, like so many businesses these days, um, data is at the core of lots of stuff that we do. Right. And I've got a lot of questions about that, actually, that I'll get to later. But this B2B business is something that mm. I hadn't considered. Mm. As an FT service, can you give me a little bit more background on how that works? I mean, I know how the B2C business works, right? I'm yeah, an individual. Sure. I buy the subscription. Yeah. I read I read yeah. the publication. But how about mm-hmm. for B2B? What other services do they get? 
Well, there's um, there's not just reading it. There's lots of uh, uh, analytical and statistical product that you can buy with it. Um, the idea is that. Um, you, we try to get, we try to do global licenses, but sometimes it doesn't work that way, and so you've got to do it um, region by region. But um, so I'm sure I can pick any name out of a hat. You, you've got, um, let me think of a nice, well, lots of central banks. Let's say the Bank of England have got a corporate license. So right. that the use of that is that um, we can also see what they like to read. So, for example, if you're seeing that what's what's occupying everybody's um, time at the moment is thinking about well, what will the next big crash be? Is is there going to be an issue around debt again very shortly? You're starting to see a spike in that kind of um, download or reading of that sort of information. We know that um, there might be a way to push push um, that kind of information in, a, in that direction and we might be able to create uh, feeds around it or newsletters around it so that we can really speak to the things that are occupying our readers' minds. Uh, and that, of course, is really important. We didn't have this business 10 years ago. This no. is a business that's gone from nothing to really somewhere uh, under the leadership of Casper de Bono who runs all our B2B uh, business globally and he's got a fantastically active team and they're 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 almost like scientists. They're almost like data scientists. The way they approach it with great rigor and discipline, and that's turned into a business that's now worth tens of millions of pounds for the FT um, from a standing start just a decade ago. Right. I mean, and that was really the question I was going to ask you: is you have all the resources, right? You do mm-hmm. all the research. You look at companies, but you also look at both the macro economy, you know, locally, regionally, and globally. Yep. And yep. then, and, and also on a country by country basis, it mm-hmm. seems like there's a big business and you've been doing it for a hundred years. I mean, how, mm-hmm. I don't know how long it's been, but all the accumulated data you have must be mm. sellable from an analytics standpoint, not just yes. to sovereigns and to central banks, but also to hedge fund. Anybody that wants that data should be really mm. interested in, in paying for that, I would think. Yeah, and um, and actually, Michael, you've quite perspicaciously picked on a business that we are uh, really looking at very closely, particularly with our new owners, uh, the Nikkei, which is um, the biggest media group in uh, in in Japan. Right. So they put, they bought us um, just about eighteen months ago, almost two years now, uh, and of course, with their firepower in Japan um, and um, our reach globally, we've been able to. Um, <clears throat> Work together to think about some, a whole lot of different businesses that we'll be able to pull together and uh, that we'll be able to present um, to a broader client base. And one of them is pooling this enormous, deep well of information and data uh, to provide a, a fantastically useful um, database for um, for investors uh, across lots of different sectors, but particularly around investors looking to Asia and unlisted companies because, yes, as yes. you well know, uh, the the number of privately owned companies in Asia um, is is still way out of whack um, with uh, with those that are that are publicly listed. So that kind of, and that's a bit of a mystery, but there's still lots of um, Potential around those companies and around those sectors, but it, it's opaque. So the more um, analysis that is is available to prospective investors around the world, the, the more informed their decisions are going to be. So yeah, this is a this is a business that we're looking at very closely at the moment, and that's about all I can say. <laughs> yeah. So again, I, I don't want any proprietary information, right? But my brain mm. is actually slightly on overdrive right now. Right. Can I just go through this? Just have a little bit of patience with me on this, right? So in the old days, you oh, had... Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, but in the old days, you had, uh, you know, an investment, not you, but there was an investment banking business that built a trading mm-hmm. business around it to support mm-hmm. secondary activities um, mm-hmm. in, in, in securities that an investment bank issued. Yep. But then around that business, you had a research business that said, of all the IPOs that we've done, here are the five, you know, six months later that we think are the best and we think you should double down or get out or whatever it is on those businesses. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but that whole financial business has just been turned upside down, and the the business that provided research kind of got unbundled and sort of separated mm-hmm. out because, in a way, nobody was paying for that research anymore because it seemed conflicted, 
right? Yes, but yes. Well, we've all, everyone, everyone, you know, we've, I've been a financial journalist for a long time and uh, sure. before I went to the business side and, and front running is, um, is as old as apple pie, right? Yeah, but the thing is you can't run, you can't front run a private equity business or, a, or what I'll call a venture capital business, but I don't yeah. really love that term anymore. But I mm. keep thinking about, and in Asia, like you said, there's a different opportunity than there is in Europe and the United States, right? Because mm. there's a huge, private equity, which means private company business, like you mm. said, that's slightly mm. opaque, but still gets covered mm-hmm. by the Financial Times. I've got a bunch of questions about this, but is there an advisory business that's Chinese walled, for lack of a better term, because mm. of all the data and all the information and all the research? So you're, you're looking at this kind of from the flip side. You already do all the research when you yeah. go out and report on them. Mm. You know what I mean? Is there an advisory business on the other side that separated from the sort of business and research side that says, we know all these things about the private equity business. We can't front run because that doesn't exist. But mm. would you pay for data on private equity as well so to help investors in those businesses too? And then we can – I want to talk in a bit about venture capital and new media too because I have some mm. ideas there. But I'm just curious mm. how you think about that. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and we hadn't spoken about know. it before. So, it's, you yeah. know, again, if you just want to say, I'll think about it, that's fine. But I, hmm. I just think about differentiated business models all the time. And it seems to hmm. me, here's the way I look at it, right? AWS was a business that, and you'll see where this is connected in a second, hopefully, but AWS was a business that Amazon built because they needed to be able to service new businesses internally that they really wanted to just plug and play. In other words, setting up yeah. new servers and new services for each individual business that they built didn't scale. Mm-hmm. And then they realized if we're doing this anyway, why not build excess capacity or maybe they just had excess capacity and then let's sell it to people yeah. to use. And then mm-hmm. businesses can now scale automatically by using the AWS platform. And I kind of see mm-hmm. the FT's information and research and sort of investigative business as kind of like that AWS business Mm. For information, if that makes sense, because I always wondered why, you know, Amazon always knew which startups or at least had a view onto which startups were going to get bigger because they saw the data usage, right, that they had even before an investor could see it. Yep. You're doing all this and not you personally, but the FT and business, <laughs> otherwise you'd be way too busy. We already talked about that. You have too much to I'm do with it. I'm just signing. I'm just signing. I'm not giving you other work to do, by the way. <laughs> but but you have you have all this infrastructure in place. It's already doing all this work, and I wonder how you apply that then in an AWS way. You have the platform. You have the mm. resources. You're doing all the work. Is there another business on top of that? I, I don't know. I'm just curious what you think. Well, I'd love to think there was because, as you say, it's just kind of uh, – it's it's reshuffling the, the deck chairs um, <laughs> on the deck. But in so, reverse, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, – but, of course, we always got to think about – the issues of that Chinese war right, that you, the conflict, that you right? mentioned, the conflict. It, yeah. And I'd hate to, I'd hate people to suddenly not have faith in what they read with us or, or, or what sure. we, what we sell to them because there's something else in our back pocket. I, I, there's a, there's an example which has happened quite recently and it's, it probably even goes further than this and that's um, Bloomberg's yep. uh, decision a couple of weeks ago to set up a whole a cons- um, a consultancy business um, for corporate clients. So right. I, I, mean, I was fascinated by that because it's clearly a big investment but like 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 exactly the same way you're talking, um, you're speaking. Bloomberg's got this extraordinary raft of um, data and information that they should be able to collate, curate that spe- that special word of the right. of the 21st century, and and present in a saleable form. And then they're overlaying that with um, human analysis, um, a la a Bain or a McKinsey. So I, I'm fascinated to see how that's going to work. And, and what happens when um, uh, a particular client says, I'm paying you quite a lot of money a year for this particular service, but then you've got your news um, journalists writing stories about how shitty my annual results are. So, uh, you know, I'm just wondering how all that is going to play out. And if I was smarter, I'd be able to, to tell you right now. But at the moment, I'm, I'm just trying to figure how we can slice and dice that um, to, to make it work for us. Yeah, I just think there are multiple opportunities there. And, and the, the reason why it struck me was because, as I said earlier, 
in the old days, as we got into the early to mid 2000s, nobody mm. was willing to pay for the research that the big investment mm. banks did. But you're yeah. already getting paid. Yes, we are already getting paid. Right, because that's mm. the subscription model that you, and it's so interesting to me, right? I watch all these new digital media businesses mm. come up and they're all based on advertising, mm. which I think mm. is a, it's a bit of a fool's game, but not really. You need to advertise somewhat, right? But it can't be the yep. only thing. It's your content has to be compelling enough. Mm. You know, it's like I say, you don't go to a movie theater and just walk in and go, you know, I'll pay you for the popcorn only because the movie is mm. a freemium event for me. It just doesn't mm. work that way. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I do know what you mean. And of course, you've got to have, um, you've got to get away from an advertising model if you're in media. Um, because unless you're hugely mass, uh, and you're, you're totally programmatic, you don't have any people, you don't care where you, you know, what ads sit on your site. But for us, of course, as a, as a niche premium product, I mean, our brand is a lot bigger than our business, right? There's, there's only sure. about three and a half thousand people that work for the FT globally. You compare that to a lot of the people that are in our competitive set and we're tiny. And then you look at the other people that, that are in our competitive set that are new over the last 10 years, like the Facebook and the Google, and we're minuscule. So for us, we've got to be super careful about how we um, seek revenue. And for, for us, the holy grail has always been regular, renewable revenue. And as we saw, uh, particularly and it's still burned on my on my soul. Um, the global financial crisis of, of almost ten years ago. You see what happened to advertising then. Already, you were seeing print go down in favor right. of um, of online advertising, and that's fine because you can be on both sides of that equation. But the way it just crashed, the way in the space of a week, our, our revenues fell away, not just us, but everybody else. That right. was such a chilling moment because if we had any doubt that, that the move to, to subscription was <laughs> an interesting experiment as opposed to an absolute imperative, that was very clear from that day on. And uh, I, I was always very surprised when this was not a, 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 a light bulb moment for so many of our competitors. But for us... It completely reinforced our business model. Right. And again, I was talking to somebody on the other side of the business, right, on the advertising side of the business earlier. And I don't think, and we were talking about this concept of is your online life different than your offline life, right? In other words, yeah. as it relates to privacy and paying for things and, and other details like that. But I think, you know, nobody received the Financial Times on their doorstep every morning or on their desk at work for no. free. Everybody paid no. for it. And it was you never, did. and, and, and there were still advertisements in there and, you know, they were mm -hmm. always super premium advertisers as well. And it, mm. I, I remember, I literally do, like when the Washington Post and the New York Times and the FT f first went online and I remember thinking, is this free? <laughs> you know, because the idea was, the idea was, well, you don't have a printing press anymore. I mean, you do, but you didn't to, for, to produce that. So, mm -hmm. so distribution is frictionless and then it should be free then. And I thought to myself, sure, but you have web designers and mm -hmm. backend servers and all that stuff kind of replaces at the same level. In other words, if you're going to distribute this to a million people or 10 million people globally, it's going to cost you way more than it would to just have a printing press somewhere outside of London and then distribute it into the city. So it, it I never, totally agree. Right? But it never made any sense to me. So now the rest of the media world is realizing you have to pay for it. It doesn't mm. seem to me to be <laughs> like a new idea. And that was the conversation I was having with the advertising guy. It's like, mm. it, you know, give, whether you give up privacy, we can talk about that too, or anonymity. We've never been anonymous either. So I don't think it changes online and I don't think your business changes online except that it gives you a bigger market to address. And mm. what happens then is that, and I'm going to make up a name, right? What happens is that the, you know, the whole Massachusetts post, which only has 10,000 people in town, that probably mm. goes away. Mm -hmm. But that's okay, actually, right? Because it gets replaced by people reading the FT. Yeah, although as a as a, a journalist at heart, I hate to see things closing. And I think there but, is still a place for regional, even local news because yeah. people do need to know. I need to know if that bus line has uh, sure. has been turned off or they're going to build a parking lot on that on that p bit of parkland. Um, but. Uh, you, maybe you just need to log in to a small community website to get that, you know, so it, it becomes a much more of a, uh, uh, and more, when I say community, I mean the community right. is feeding into that. Maybe it becomes like a Wikipedia type of, uh, of, of organization. But, um, 
What was the beginning of your question there yeah, before so, I riffed no, just, up on that? I just think the subscription model, I don't think oh, it's, yeah. uh, like you said, it's a, you know, it, the light went off in everybody's head. And I think for people mm. like you, you've already known that. Like that was the way the business was going to make money. That's yeah. the annuity into that business because yeah. even in an economic downturn, people still need information that they trust. But mm-hmm. th- what they don't need is an advertisement for a Lexus maybe. Do you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. that's going to yeah. go away. And advertisers get scared, but – Readers don't get scared. They want more information, not less. And I think we've found that actually over the last mm. year. So I, I'd love to know, and I don't, I don't want you to answer this, but my mm. guess is that for, for like really great online subscription businesses, that subscriptions have probably spiked 25% in the last year, 18 months. I, I don't know what that number is, but I'm sure they've spiked quite a bit just because people are hungry for real information. Mm, mm. And, and, and they spike. According to events. Correct. So we got a big spike at, at Brexit, the time of Brexit, because people are going, I don't know what this means for my business. Is it good? Is it bad? You know, how is it going to affect me? So we saw a big spike in subscriptions then. Um, also around the um, last US general election, what does a Trump pre- presidency mm. mean for, for the world? Um, <laughs> everyone's still asking that question right now, but <laughs> it's, uh, it, it was a, it's a mystery and it's the unknown. So what, what, how do you face the unknown? You kind of look at history, you look at what's going on in the world today, and you try to draw these threads together and make some kind of calculated, intelligent prediction. So, uh, and that's what people think when they uh, make a decision, I suppose, to to subscribe to the FT under those circumstances. And not just us. I'm sure they're looking at the Economist. I'm sure they're looking at uh, the Wall Street Journal. They're looking at um, you know the Harvard Business Review. I mean. Right. Learn to be more analytical. Learn, to, learn from case studies. Learn from the past to try and um, throw inform- throw some kind of uh, light on the future. Um, but just to harken back to your point about the cost of journalism right. and the cost of running a premium website, uh, uh, it's really costly. It costs a lot of money sure. because immersive journalism is very, very, very expensive to produce. Um, you've got to have a lot more video. You've got to have people out in the field. Um, you need to have a lot more interactive graphics. Um, you ne- that's, that kind of software is expensive. We try to do a lot of it in-house. We have hundreds of developers working for the FT. Um, so we try to do as much as we can ourselves, but there are times you've really just got to either buy in the talent or buy in um, uh, external software. So it becomes... Um, a constantly hungry monster. It costs a fortune just to maintain the quality and then to improve and increase uh, what we do, then that costs another bunch of cash on top of what it costs to maintain um, our existing level of quality. So it's a hungry beast. So you've got to feed it with as much as possible. So we love ads. You know, don't think that we don't enjoy advertising revenue. For I sure. love it. For sure. But um, it's it's got to be subsidiary to um, renewable subscription. And of course, last year we crossed that um, that we had that tipping point. So now we make more money from subscriptions than we do from um, advertising. That's Is that unprecedented in the history of the FT or is that that's yes, a normal state? That's, that's unprecedented. unprecedented. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. And it's a, it's taken a lot of work by a lot of people. Fair enough. Mm. You, can we talk a little bit about the newer side of the media, the video, the podcasting? Mm-hmm. Like, mm. do you think there's a generational change that's taking place that's going to feature that type of content more as that generation sort of becomes the main audience for the content that you're producing? And if that's true, mm-hmm. what do you do to become expert in that new media space? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's it's becoming more prevalent and not just because um, younger people are interested in our news. I think it's because people, our, our, our readership, they like gadgets. They like being first movers. They like being um, early adopters. So we're finding people that have been our subscribers for 30, 40 years just as keen to listen to podcasts or watch video or, um, you know, download the app so that they can – um, and then download the FT so they can read it at their leisure on on a flight. You know, we're finding that they're receptive right across a whole different age age group. So interesting. Yeah, it's it is interesting, and for for us, the, for what I find even more interesting is that the the paper 
won't die. You know, there's about <laughs> 200,000 copies of the paper that's printed every day. It's come down from a high of almost 500,000 copies about, you know, about 10 years ago. But it, it, it seems to just sit there. It floats on that, on that 200,000 level. And we wonder why that is. And I think it's partly it's because people, there are still people that prefer to look at it first thing in the morning. But it's almost the, the danger, the, the, the crack co- t- cocaine of, of, um, uh, the digital world. It's very hard to figure out where there's a beginning and a middle and an end of anything online. Correct. Because it's, it's infinite. So the paper, and this is how our read workshops have explained it to us, at least when we get the paper, we know that there's, this is what some of the world's best journalists and editors thought was the most important thing for us to read at a given time. And and it's got the front page and it's all the stuff that we know where to find in the middle and then we go to the end. And then so that kind of kicks off my day. So And then they go to to the online version for the rest of the day for updates and, and then they kind of, because we send them off to various other parts of the web as well um, to, to, further their inf- to further the information. So I think that that's an interesting thing. And, of course, in some markets we are we're still a, um, a status symbol. So it, people like to walk around with it underneath their arm. I found, I, I found my absolute, well, it was kind of nice, but it was also a bit, a bit like, oh God, I wonder if they asked anybody, a very, very, very expensive Italian menswear brand. Um, I was walking by his shop in Queens Road Central, um, and saw, oh, every single one of the male models wearing their <laughs> two, three thousand US dollar suits has got an FT under their arm or is poking a, out of their pocket is that okay? or sticking. Yeah. Well, you know, it isn't. It isn't should, right. I mean, that's great. It isn't. It isn't. You know, they they should have asked. Um, right. But then I thought on the bright side, and I thought I bet you they had to buy about you know a thousand copies of the newspaper to put them in <laughs> to put right. them so in their shop windows. <laughs> so as long as they weren't messing with the content, it was just sitting there. I I kind of didn't mind. But um, that's that's the other side of it. You, why why shut something that that doesn't need shutting? So we we nurture the the newspaper we made sure that we've got to a level whereby um it's self-sustaining without advertising so it makes it breaks even and makes money before any of the ads are included in it so the 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 newspaper is a a healthy um thriving pink and glowing creature um that uh we are we're proud to have and of course what's our single biggest um most potent um, marketing tool globally. I think it's the pink paper. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I think it's a status symbol, right? To a certain extent, mm. I'd love to have an Apple Watch, but mm. it, there's no status associated with it in the same way that there is wearing a Breitling mechanical watch. Yes. Yeah. And You've been in Asia far too long, Michael, if I might like to. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing you do in a business meeting is look at what someone's watch is. Is that the case? <laughs> Of course, and calculate, you know, oh, that's a very interesting uh, one in the series. It's not, that's limited edition. So, um, yeah, that kind of thing, that kind of status symbol um, value shouldn't be underrated, I think, for the FT. And as I said, you know, it markets our product so uh, around the world and – and people then know what an FT Live event is about. You know, oh, the FT, that's that newspaper. Oh, let's buy FT.com. That newspaper is something that I've, I'm, I'm familiar with and I know is a quality, a quality, um, item. So yeah, it's really, really useful to us on lots of different levels. Angela, I feel like you're reading off my notes. Oh, really? I really do. I know, maybe, I, maybe I'm just a. No, no, because a I feel psychic. like. No, 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 because I feel like there's like a camera shining down on the little notepad that I have next. Because the, the <laughs> next thing I wanted to talk to you about, about was FT Live, uh-huh. right? Because this is. Can you explain what it is? And then I've got a bunch of other follow up questions about it. But just for the listeners that don't necessarily know what FT Live is, I have a few questions after you explain it. So please. Okay. Uh, FT Live is a is what it says. It's the FT coming alive in our conferences and events division. So we did around uh, we we staged about 195 events globally. Almost, yeah, almost yeah, 200 last, events last year. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And it's not far off that this year as well. Um, but we have, we've, we've switched the mix a bit so that we do fewer client tailored events, um, and more 
big pillar events uh, that follow the news agenda and uh, involve many of our journalists who work with us to get the um, agenda together, think about who the, the best speakers would be in, in that given sector, and of course then they in turn turn up to the event and they're our, they, they provide the backbone of our um, uh, chairmanship and also our moderation. So it is the FT coming alive um, around certain subject matter and uh, it also gives people a chance to uh, meet their peers and of course as we become more virtual in the way we operate our businesses uh, being able to eyeball uh, someone from your tribe um, is, is a really valuable thing to know that you can come together once or twice a year um, for this particular event uh, they know they're going to meet their, their their mates, meet their competitors, meet their customers, uh, and that's that's a very valuable experience. And of course, in a in a five star quality FT environment, so you're safe, but you are stimulated at the same time. Right. So, and are these are, are these arranged around specific verticals? Right. Like, is there a tech event, a, a finance yeah. event, and or, or is it just yeah. or is it just current events, things that have happened recently, or a combination? No. Well, so it's a combination of the two. So um, as as um, there's industry changes, we will we will then start to focus on that. So, for example, uh, three years ago, we didn't have a cybersecurity um, conference, but now we have cybersecurity conferences in the US, the UK, and Europe, and we're planning one for Asia. Nice. Um, so we we didn't think about AI, but you know now we are running a whole raft of um, events around um, humans and machine learning, and you know trying to figure out how this is all going to be complementary one for the other. It's do we are we afraid as as Elon Musk says we might be, um, or do we figure out how to get the best out of it and apply it to our business? And of course then that leads to a um, whole lot of um, conversation around the future of work. Uh, do you have a job? And if you have a job, how are you going to do it? How are you going to accomplish those tasks? And then you think about the future of manufacturing if you've got all these changes in technology. So one thing kind of leads to the other, and it's 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 intriguing because um, these these sorts of events always open up a whole new lot of ideas for us to think about. Um, A little bit later down the track, and and deepen those kind of um, that kind of subject matter, uh, and go in. Of course, then you take them into different markets. You know, we're doing more work in South America, more work in Africa, private equity in Africa, um, sustainable investing in emerging markets, including Africa and South America. You know, the, it's as long as your arm. Right. Uh, health, health, of course, is another um, um, digital health. How's that going to affect our lives and uh, um, our lives personally, but also our investment world and how we allocate our our funds. So it it is it's as long as a piece of string, really. It's um, and it and it's just as fascinating. And that's the and that's really the end of the question. String is, theory. <laughs> yeah. It's so <laughs> string theory exactly. But that's kind of the end of the question. That is, after doing all these events, doing all this research, running a big online and offline publication, right? Mm. You just have all this information. I kind of talked about it earlier about, you know, yeah. building a business that's advisory yeah. around it. But even more than that, you see so many different things, right? And I kind of yeah. want to make what I'll call the Netflix analogy, right? Yeah. So yeah. Disney, you know, six years ago and all the other sort of media companies sees Netflix and says, we'll give them, we'll allow them to be a channel for distribution for our business because they get this tech thing. We don't care about it. No one's going to download a movie. It doesn't really matter, but it's a good way to test it. Mm. They wake up one day, they've invested no money in a Netflix business, and Netflix is now worth 80, has a market cap of $80 billion. Mm -hmm. yep. So are you it, – because it's interesting to me that you – now with the Nikkei as an investor or a partner mm -hmm. in the FT yeah. business, which is a great thing, right? That's going to happen. Yeah. And that's a beautiful thing because you're going to both have different core competencies. The Japanese business is going to get run differently than the FT business. And that's good, not yeah. bad, I think. Mm -hmm. But are you, as a team, are you out, are you actively looking for that new business that could be the Netflix of publishing? Mm -hmm. to create another $80 billion of value in that same sense. Are you actively doing that as well with all this information that you have? Yep. 
Yeah, well, I, I alluded to it earlier. We are we are looking at a new business, um, a joint venture with our uh, Nikkei partners, um, and around how we can work our data um, and information much harder. Right. So, yeah, we are looking at that. I don't know if it's a Netflix moment, but it's our first it's our first foray into something that is you know a pure data. Um, an analytical business and going into the for for those 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 clients that you already mentioned right. um, VC as you say private equity everything's private equity these days right. but looking into that that just just global investment world doesn't matter what kind of investor you are you need information so we're not going to pick and choose between the categories but we just want to we just want to be out there and uh, available at a an excellent premium price for people <laughs> who want to know more about um the places that they'd like to allocate their cash yeah no i mean obviously i think it's a great idea right and that's why i brought this up and kind of if you look at the way if you look at the flow of my notes it's kind of all led into I like the event business as well because I think the event business creates what I'll call a virtuous circle from that mm-hmm. information that you have. Events, yeah. people come there, you get more information, mm. but then you understand more by creating that network what the sort of implications are of all that information mm. and to turn that into yeah. – from because, see, for me as a, as a new media business, right, I don't have the same – restrictions on conflict of interest and I you know yes. but but I still hold myself to a standard right of course I do I definitely do and you'll see this over time right in other words I have a ton of information and I've led my entire life like this most of which I won't share because it's the wrong thing to do just from an integrity mm-hmm. standpoint yeah but for the things that are shareable and the things that I can make the case that it was okay to do that, I can also – right. one of the reasons why I do what I do is to get information to build an investment business around it, right? That's one thing we haven't spoken about. But I am an angel investor and a private investor as well. Mm-hmm. And by talking to people and creating a network, I create a virtuous circle around what is the next big thing? How mm-hmm. can I learn about it, right? Can, how can yeah. I go to an event like an FT event that's on health tech or med tech or mm-hmm. – artificial intelligence or um, mm. augmented reality, mm-hmm. learn about that and then invest in that and create that virtuous circle of investment. And I really don't see any reason why you guys can't do the same thing with all, because it's in my notes, like with all of the resources and all of the information that you have, it just sounds like in today's world, that's mm. just another possibility. So the fact that you're doing that in a way, right? And you, in the right yeah. way, yeah? Yeah. With the Nikkei as your back end resource is actually a great mm. thing, I think. Mm, I hope so. Fingers crossed that it all works out, and I'm sure we'll be talking a lot more about it um, in a in a few months when we've got um, a lot more uh, of our marketing material and um, the 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 back end stuff. Because you can imagine um, it, that is pretty non-trivial. sophisticated. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, super non trivial. But that's again, that's the part about it that I like a lot, right? In other words. Mm. You know, we joked again, and we'll probably joke for the entire time that we know each other about, you know, mm. signing signing documents. But one of the great mm. things about the position that you're in is your ability to learn about all the new things that are yes. going on in the world, right? So you get to Absolutely. literally go home at night and think, I can't believe I just was exposed to that thing that's so new and so interesting. And now yeah. I get to figure out how I apply that, you know, again, not just to my local business and my regional no. business, but I sit on the board too. So mm. how, what does that mean globally? And that to me mm. is fascinating. Mm, yeah, and of course that means that um, uh, you well always learning. Frankly, I mean, there's just that's that's one of the reasons why I don't know why um, or how I'd ever retire right. from the, the workforce because there's just so much going on. And of course, it's not as if we're ever going to get to the end of it anymore. It's not no, like there's no, no, a digital. No. Tr- there's not a transition. It's the future is here it's and constant. it's never going to stop. It's just constantly um, bombarding us. And as I said, sort of coming back around to the beginning, any tools that you can use that help you make sense out of the noise um, is is worth paying for. Yeah, agreed. So I was I'll, – I'll end with this, right? I have so many more things I want to talk to you about, but hopefully we'll get together again soon and we can talk about more things, right? But sure. I'll end with this. One of the sort of proprietary traders at Goldman Sachs once said to me, he came out of an engineering background and he said to me this, Mm. he goes, an engineer's job is to eliminate noise and look for signals. And if you can look for signals, but that's his job, right? It sounds trite, but it actually, that's what they do, right? They have this wire and on that wire, there's Mm. all this information, most of which Mm. is useless and they look for signals. And when you find those signals, whether it's a trading signal or a business signal, as Mm. you said, your job as the FT as a source of information is to eliminate the noise and create signals mm. for people. And I like mm-hmm. the fact that you've actually said that. That's interesting mm. to me. Mm. 
Yeah, it's um, it's it is it it's the purpose. It's our purpose, right? It's we've got and we have to yes. be fit for purpose. Yeah, agreed. Mm. Oh, I feel like I could keep going. Look, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I really appreciate you doing this again, and hopefully you'll come back with us and do more. Um, I hope so. I mean, I've really enjoyed it. It does make me – I've taken notes from my own conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate a conversation. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.